Well, hey, if we have not had a chance to meet, uh, my name is Aaron, and I'm one of the pastors here, and just want to welcome you personally and let you know that we really are excited that you're here with us this morning. And if you're just jumping in, just you know, we're, we're three weeks into a series uh, entitled The Sermon on the Mount. And uh, in the Sermon on the Mount series, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, and if you don't know what that is, it's, it's, this, it's a very epic sermon that Jesus gave in the Gospels. And it is maybe the most boiled down kind of Cliff's Notes version of what Jesus was about. And some people say it's the epicenter of his, his ministry. And I would say actually the cross is probably the epicenter of his ministry. But when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, really, uh, Jesus is teaching and telling us what the cross is going to be all about. Right? And so the Sermon on the Mount has been said that it's, the Sermon on the Mount is like a, a commentary on Jesus' life, and Jesus' life was a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. So if you ever wanted to know, what is Jesus really about? What was he about? What did he say? What did he pronounce? Um, what was he doing? Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a great place to be. And, uh, and so that's, that's where we're at. And uh, one of the things that we find very early on is that Jesus says some things that strike us immediately as very, very strange. How many of you know what a, a paradox is? Most of us probably, I actually have a definition for you, all right? A paradox is this. Uh, it's a statement or proposition that, despite sound reasoning from acceptable premises, leads to a conclusion that seems senseless, logically unacceptable, or self-contradictory, all right? So I've got like some visual representations of some paradoxes. Do you want to throw the first one up there? That's a paradox. What am I, what, what, what am I supposed to do? All right, illiterate, write for free help. <laughs> it's a paradox. Nothing is written in stone. Paradox, my favorite. Touching wires causes instant death and a $200 fine. <laughs> right? All of them uh, are paradoxes. Uh, another fo- paradoxes come in many different shapes and forms. Uh, oxymorons are other kind of paradox. Uh, things like uh, jumbo shrimp, you know, doesn't quite go together. Uh, or government efficiency is one of my favorites. Um, or my, probably my favorite is Microsoft Works. You know, and so they're just like, I don't think that's right, you know? And so when we hear Jesus begin the Sermon on the Mount, he begins with these things called Beatitudes. And uh, Beatitude really means blessing. And he starts to pronounce that this is who is blessed in the kingdom of God. When God's full reign uh, takes place in this world, on this earth, when Jesus returns and God's kingdom comes in, his, in its fullness, these are the people who are going to be blessed. And, and what we find immediately is that these, they're not the people, the kind of people that we uh, would normally say are blessed. You know, they're, they're not the kind of people that in this world, with the way that this world operates, with the values of this world, um, they're different. They're very, very different. We find that the way that the kingdom of God works and functions, who it values, who it honors, the way that it works is almost opposite uh, and, and contradictory to everything that we know about how this world actually works. And so Jesus says things that strike us very, very strange. And so he begins by saying things like this. All right, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, and then he says this, and we're going to hone in uh, this morning. And he says, blessed are those who mourn. Right, and here the paradox is really on full display. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. Yeah, he's essentially saying, happy are the sad. Blessed are the depressed. Right? And so I just, to begin, I want to just put something out on the table. And first of all, just to kind of maybe admit together that I, I don't think any of us are inclined to believe this. Based on what we know, blessed are, are the depressed, happy are the sad, blessed are those who mourn. I don't think any of us are naturally inclined to believe this. And to take it even a, a step further, um, I would say I don't think we even want to believe this. Because just to state the obvious, uh, none of us want to mourn, right? None of us want to mourn. I don't know if you can remember the last time in your life when you were just overwhelmed with sorrow, right? And you lost something or somebody dear to you, and you were just deep in grief and mourning. Can you remember what that felt like? Right, was that a pleasant experience? Right, of, of course it wasn't, right? None of us uh, want to mourn, and so I think it's just to get honest at the beginning, like if we had it our way, right, if we were to tell Jesus what we really wanted to be true, right, if, uh, 
if our life was really just about us and what is comfortable for us, what is easy for us, what is convenient for us, uh, none of us would choose this for ourselves because none of us want uh, to mourn. And so when we hear this, blessed are the mourning, for they will be comforted. You know, like even the, re- the reasoning strikes as a strange, and for me, it seems to come up a little bit short. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Right, Jesus, I have a better idea. How about we skip the mourning part and go right to the comfort, you know? Like just, just, just comfort forever, you know? <laughs> like, or how about blessed are those who never mourn, for they'll never have to be comforted, you know? Like for me, I think that's the beatitude really that we want. But Jesus announces to us that, no, blessed are those, blessed are those who mourn. Right? And, and I think it's worth pointing out, you know, that whether we, whether we like it or not, or whether we want it or not, or whether we know how to do it well or not, no matter how hard we work, no matter how good we are, how faithful we remain, no matter what we do, how we do it, when we do it, why we do it, every single one of us will mourn. Sooner or later, for some of us, sooner, much sooner than later, that mourning is, is a universal experience. We are, we are all going to have to mourn. And so in some sense, uh, we all have to learn how. And of course, some of us already do. There's something, there's something basic about it. It's almost primal, uh, certainly unavoidable, universal experience uh, of mourning. And Eugene Peterson says it this way. He said, you know, when we, when we, we come into this world as, as little babies, right? And what's the first thing you did, you know, when you were When you're born, you probably don't remember, but you probably saw maybe pictures or hopefully not video, but maybe there was video, right? One of the first things you did, right, is we cry. And he says, uh, we go out the same way, surrounded by mourning and tears. And if it isn't our mourning and tears, it's the people who love us who are having to let us go. It's there at the beginning and it's there at the end. And in between, Peterson says, is what he calls the substratum to our life. I had to look that word up. And substratum means it's it's the foundation. It's like the river that runs through it. It's the thing that's always beneath the surface. It's always present. It's always there uh, mourning. It's just kind of there. And so in one sense, when Jesus identifies this and he calls attention to it, as he does in Matthew 5, uh, he's he's legitimizing it. I think he's saying in a sense that it's all right to mourn. It's all right to feel this weird thing that sometimes we just feel underneath The surface, it's okay, it's all right, and in fact, in some strange way, it's blessed. Blessed are those who can mourn, and blessed are those who who do. If we zoom out a little bit and we look at mourning itself, the reason, generally speaking, that we mourn is because of loss. Right, some sense of loss. And sometimes we can put our finger on that loss. And, and it's very easy to identify. Right? We can name the loss because we lost a friend. Right? Or we lost a loved one. Right? Or we lost a job. Or we lost a dream. Right? Or we lost some sense of ourselves, a sense of security or peace or confidence or hope, a sense of normalcy. And, and we, can, we can put our finger on it. And we, but when we know what we've lost, right, we've lost a friend, a parent, a job, a dream, what you're not wondering in that moment at least is why, right? Because you, as painful as it is, right, your sadness and grief makes sense because you can name it. At least you know why you're sad. You know why you hurt. You know why you're, you're grieving. And, and in that sense, if you can name it, at least in some sense, on some level, we're fortunate because, and maybe even blessed, um, because sometimes, sometimes we can't name it. You know, if you weren't here in the spring, we did a, a series on depression and anxiety uh, called The Dark Passenger, and if you missed it, it's, it's on our website. And um, I knew as we were getting ready to do this series, I'd been kind of bouncing around in my own head and heart for a while because it's a part of my story. And, and so I started asking people what they thought about doing a series of it, and I wanted to hear from people, their struggles, their experiences, uh, you know, their own story journeying through it. And the response before we ever started the series was overwhelming, and I knew it was going to be huge, and it was. I, I don't think we have ever had half the response to any series we've ever done as we did to depression uh, and anxiety. And, and we did it partly because it is a, a big part of, of my story, and if you struggle with depression and anxiety, uh, one of the things that you know about depression and anxiety clinically is oftentimes one of the things that makes it hardest 
is that you don't know why you feel the way that you do. You can't name it. You can't put your finger on it. It's just that the fog has descended and they are heavy and it's dark and you're sad and you don't, you don't know why. And then, you know, it's like, babe, it's not you. It's not the church. It's not the kids. It's not life. Like, all is good. It's, I know God has not abandoned me, but it's just the way it is and you can't name it. Right? And for those of you who have been there, just as quickly, you know, the, the depression subsides and the fog lifts and things are good again. And again, you don't know why. It just does. Um, you know, last night we were uh, at a wedding. Our, we had a family member who had a wedding and we were reconnected. We had a bunch of family who came in from uh, Colorado and out of state. And we had seen each other for the first time in a few years and we were reconnecting and it's like, man, it's been a few years. Like, what's going on? And we started to reflect with the last time we were together and the last time we were together was for the funeral of Megan's grandma, Doris. And we began to reflect on that. And uh, Megan's grandma, she helped raise Megan. And uh, we had actually lived with her a couple times uh, while we were in transition. And uh, even when we bought her own home, we were very close to her. And so we were very, very close. And I'll never forget that weekend because there were a lot of tears. There's a lot of laughter too, but a lot of tears. You know, and, and in that moment, I will say that, uh, that as hard as it was, um, in that moment, there was like this odd sense of freedom to grieve and to feel what we felt, to feel the pain, to feel the loss, to feel, to feel the heaviness. And, and honestly, the freedom felt good. Now, the grief, the loss, the pain, none of that felt good, but the freedom to actually grieve uh, felt, felt very good. And when, it, when this gets really hard, it's when you don't feel that freedom and when you can't say, oh, Doris is gone. This is why I feel the way that I feel. I lost this. This is why I'm depressed. This is why I'm heavy. This is why I'm sad. This is why I'm broken. This is why I'm grieving. Right? And in those moments, I would say it can actually be worse because we can't name it. You just, you just feel stuff. You know, this morning I'm wearing a t-shirt uh, from an organization uh, called To Write Love on Her Arms. And uh, it's an organization that seeks to bring hope and help to those who suffer from depression and anxiety, um, suicide, addiction. And the name, To Write Love in Her Arms, is actually a reference specifically to self-mutilation and to cutting. And that's never really been a part of my story, but I've, I've had friends, and that's a big part of theirs. And, and I know if you've been around Mosaic for some time that we've had a number of people who call this place home, and that is a part of their story. And sometimes I think we, sometimes we react and say stupid things like, well, that's stupid. That makes no sense, which, by the way, is super helpful, you know? <laughs> you know, but I think at, at, the, at, the, at the heart of it, like at the heart of this struggle is this, it's this feeling, like there's all these feelings inside. There's this pain, there's this grief, there's this sorrow, there's this mourning, and I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to express it. I can't name it or put my finger on it, but now I can there's my pain. I can feel that. I, 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 can, I can name that. And not, not all of us respond in that way, but I think for many of us, if we could grab coffee and really have a kind of a heart-to-heart -heart session, many of us have felt just that substratum, that, that, that pain, that mourning, that sense, that feeling that something isn't right. Right? And I got to say, I agree with Eugene Peterson that maybe, just maybe, the reason that we feel those things in seasons, maybe not all the time, but that, that feeling that something is not right, something is off, something is wrong, maybe the reason that we feel that is because something is wrong, that something is not right, something is not as the way, the way that it, it should be. And, and what is wrong is that, you know, since the fall, you and I, we have been living east of Eden, cut off uh, from our Creator, cut off from what we were created for, that things are not the way that they should be, and this side of eternity, we will never fully find it. And the thing is, here's what part of what makes it so hard, is you and I, we, we catch glimpses of it, don't we? Like, have you ever, ever had one of those moments where it's like, everything is right in the world? It is beautiful, it's like a, a moment of transcendence. You know, and maybe it's at a wedding, or, or, or on vacation, or right here, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, like on a Sunday morning, and, and you're, in, you're in worship, and it's just like you're transported to another world, and you get a glimpse of the transcendent. 
a taste of the kingdom of God. And it's like that, that, you know what I mean? And then it's like, and, and sometimes we attribute it to the wrong things. It's like, I love that song. We got to do that song again. That song's incredible, you know? And then the next time we do the song, it's like, yes, finally, we're doing the song. And you try to muster it up and you try to get to that place and you just can't, right? And it's so frustrating, because you want to live in that place, but the issue wasn't the song, right? It's just there's those moments where, where everything comes together just, just right. And we want to stay there, but this side of eternity, we can't. And I will say this, the desire for that, the, the longing to want to stay there, uh, I would say there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think it's a good thing, and I think really when it comes down to it, that's what you've been created for. Creation as it was meant to be, creation as it was, creation as it will be. The kingdom of God, it's, it's what you were built for. Right? And why, why can't we stay there? And I think sometimes we work very, very hard to, to manufacture those moments, to craft experiences where we can stay there. It's in our human nature. You know, uh, we, we picture and imagine and plan for like the perfect vacation. It's going to be perfect. There's going to be no work, maybe no kids. You know, we're going we're gonna to go there and sit there and wear that and smoke that and drink that. And man, it's going to be amazing. Maybe the a little too much information about my vacations, you know, but we, we want it to be that way and we work so hard and we save so hard and we put all this pressure on the experience to ever get there and then it's like, well, that was not what I thought it would be. You know, like this last summer as part of our sabbatical, Megan and I got to Jamaica without the kids for a week, you know, and like we, Megan was talking about this for like a year, you know, like just the countdown, you know, it's going to be so incredible and perfect and we're there, and the, the context is perfect. The gorgeous white beaches and beautiful water, you know, and, and food and drinks and the whole deal, the sun. Uh, and then I got food poisoning, you know. Horrible food poisoning, by the way. And I totally know what it was. I was the only person who ate it in our group. And, you know, and I was in the fetal position. And, you know, I remember flying back, and I was still sicker than a dog. And, and we had multiple flight delays, so it was like a 16-hour travel day. And I'm just in the fetal position at the airport. And it's like, that's not what we dreamed of. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, that, it was, this was supposed to be the perfect vacation. You know, or for some of us, it's like our wedding. Like some of us, like, you still are planning the wedding, right? And you've been planning that wedding day for years and years and years. And you know the music and the setting, what people are going to wear. And you even have planned out like what they're going to say to you. And it's going to be so perfect. <laughs> You know what I mean? And I, I do a lot of weddings, you know, as a pastor of a young church, a lot of weddings. And just so you know, it never goes according to plan. Never. Uh, and before I did this, I was a bartender at weddings. And I can remember one particular night out at the lodge, the, the, the maid of honor was the bride's sister. And she got super drunk, um, which Megan blames me for this because I was a bartender. But she had her own stuff. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, it was not my fault. But she got so just gone and she kept trying to make out with the groom, her sister's husband. And all night long, this is happening. Like, we're running, like, they're running interference. And at one point in the night, the, her, her sister, the bride, is trying to pry her off her husband, and she throws up all over her wedding dress. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to go ahead and just put this out there. I don't think that was a part of the dream, you know? Like, I don't think she ever dreamed that would happen, and I'm sure the next family gathering was a little awkward. And uh, it actually got worse than that, but it's so inappropriate I can't share it in church. But, you know, if we ever have a beer, you got to hear the rest of the story because it gets really good. Um, but, you know, like every time, every time I think we sense that longing, every time we get a taste of the transcendent, every time your heart is like, there's got to be more to it than this, I think you're smelling something. Right? You're, you're tasting something, you're sensing something inside of you that nobody else had to put there. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just there. And you want it, and we work for it, and we save for it, and we try to create experiences where we can experience it. And the problem is, even in those moments when everything is right, right and I bet you know this to be true, still even in those moments when all the chips happen right. And the one wedding that does go according to plan, still oftentimes in those moments, there can still be that sense that there's something missing. Right? It was so great. It was so beautiful. We couldn't have done it any better. And yet, somehow we know that it didn't quite do for us what we longed for it to do. And Eugene Peterson continuing, he says, you know, even on our best days, uh, we can experience this vague sense of loss underneath the surface. 
in our very existence that we're incomplete, that we've been cut off, that something is not quite right. And I would say this, the very fact that you know this, right, it's a memory of Eden. Maybe even more than that, it's, it's an instinct for God. Right? Ecclesiastes 3.11 speaks of this, and it says this, God set eternity in the human heart. Right? And I would suggest to you, this is why you and I, that the sense of that something is not quite right is so incredibly universal. Right? And when we lose somebody, there's a part of us that feels so violated, like this isn't right, this can't be right. Even when they live the full life, you know, it's like, and that page is turned and we know the world will never quite be the same again because they're not in it. There's something in us that knows this can't be right. This can't be it. There's got to be more to this life than just these 60, 70, 80, 90 years. Right? And I would suggest to you that's, that's I didn't have to tell you that. Nobody had to tell you that. You just know it in your soul because God put it there. That you and I were created for more than this. That there's more to life, there's more to your existence, there's more to your person than what you can experience with your five senses. There's more. And, and, and that, that sense, that, that memory, that instinct, it's, it's meant to draw you and I to our creator. It's meant to alert us to the fact that there is more than what we can see and smell and taste and touch and hear. But so often we, we don't make the connection, right? And rather than really be a people who are willing and able to mourn and to feel the gravity that something's broken in the world, far too often we just inebriate ourselves and we try to numb it with entertainment and skip across the surface of life and try to avoid all pain and we miss what that sense in you uh, was meant to create. And so I would say for all of us who follow Jesus, I would submit to us that, that every single one of us, we, we must learn how to mourn. We've got to learn how. Because let's just be honest, sometimes the only appropriate response is mourning. You know, when I, when I turn on the news, you know, when I hop on my Twitter feed and see on CNN once again, that innocent people were killed, murdered, you know, gunned down, blown up, going to a concert, just living out their lives because somebody with a different belief set decided it was their time. You know, every time you see somebody who's mistreated because of their sexual orientation or because of their race or because of their background or because of what they believe or what they don't believe, right, in those moments, right, all is not right with the world. Right, that is not the way that God ever intended for it to be. It's not the way that it was. It's not the way that it will be. And it's not the way that, that we are to live as God's people. And we see that the only, the only appropriate response is to grieve. You know, this week I got a message from a gal who moved out of, this, out of Lincoln, but she was a part of Mosaic for a long time. And one of her friends in Lincoln, who is a gay man, somebody called him a faggot and spit in his face in the name of Christianity, no less. You know, and I hear that, and my first response is rage, um, not very Christian thoughts, but my second response is mourning. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, how can I, what is a Christian response in that moment? I don't think it's to change the channel, to try to encourage one of them, just cheer up, don't want to think about it, it's too painful, it's too uncomfortable, I'm going to shut the TV off, I'm going to just go my merry way because that doesn't really, you know, involve me. I think in those moments, the only appropriate response is to grieve because that is not right, nor is it Christian. Are there moments when the only appropriate response is to, is to grieve? And sadly, uh, sadly, I, we are in a culture, even in the church, where we are just obsessed with, with happiness, right? I mean, our country, at least in part, was built on this entitlement to the pursuit of happiness, and sometimes in the church, we create like this unnecessary pressure on people like, no, you got to be happy, right? Because you've got the joy, 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 joy down in your heart. That's just who you are, you know, like smile, get over it. Like, don't tell me that you're not doing well. Like, and it's this undue pressure. And, and I love the way that Brian Zahn says it. He says this, we have this immature obsession with being happy all the time. It's in our culture. It seeps into our churches and it's not healthy. I think sometimes we're trying to replace the symbol of the cross, which is a symbol of suffering, by the way with a smiley face. Serious Christianity has given way to inspirational Christianity, which is in turn turning into insipid Christianity. 
Have we replaced a serious theology of the cross with pipe psychology of happiness? Have we traded something sublime and serious, majestic and mysterious for something silly, prosaic and shallow, a juvenile obsession with cheap happiness? I don't think I'm overstating the problem. Because we're uncomfortable with sorrow, we passively enforce a kind of mandated happiness in our churches. And instead of weeping with those who weep, we want everybody to just cheer up. And we want them to cheer up for our sake because we're so terribly uncomfortable with their sorrow. What we should do is join them in their sorrow and assist them in the work of grief. When human beings suffer tragedy and profound loss, there's a certain amount of grieving that is required. But in the deep mystery of human uh, interconnectivity, the work of grieving does not have to be done alone. And when we choose to bear the burden of sorrow with others, it really does lighten the load for the suffering. The question is, can we create churches that understand that mourning is not a sign of weakness, but a spiritual work to be attended to? A spiritual work that Jesus says leads to the blessedness of comfort from outside ourselves. He says this, don't miss this. The only way The only way to be happy all the time is to dive down deep inside yourself and cocoon yourself and live in an artificial world of your own creation. Because if you engage with the world as it is, there will be times when powerful asteroids of sorrow crash into your life and it leaves a crater. But it's a crater that can later be filled with something from the Lord called joy. And that's from his book, uh, Beauty Can Save the World. Right, And Zahn rightly points out that sorrow is just a necessary consequence of loving others and being fully engaged with humanity. There are times when the only appropriate response is to grieve and to mourn and lament. There's a reason that we have a whole book called Lamentations, right? And that so many of the Psalms are to weeping and hurting and expressing disgust with the way the world is and crying out to God for help and hurting with, hurting with people. I would say this, you know, mourning, mourning, we need to make a clarification here and it's this, is that mourning is not a sign of weakness, Right? It is a sign of strength. Right? If you've been around Mosaic for any length of time, you know that for us, the bullseye is always Jesus. Uh, Jesus is everything. He wasn't just a guy. He was the guy. Right? In Jesus, we get to see God as he really is, his character, his beauty, his love, his strength. Right? And I love in John chapter 11, Jesus, he comes to Lazarus' tomb too late. And Lazarus, his friend, is dead. Right? And, and Jesus walks in this scenario, and here's the thing. Jesus is about to do something incredible. Uh, he's actually about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Incredible party trick, you know what I mean? Like, you can see why many, many people were following Jesus by the time the Sermon on the Mount took place. Just many people are just blown away. Um, I would follow a guy who raises people from the dead. And so Jesus knows that this is about to happen. He knows that he has that power and capacity, but he walks into that situation and it tells us that all of Lazarus' loved ones are weeping. They are mourning. They are grieving because they lost a dad. They lost a husband. They lost a friend. And they are hurting. And when Jesus gets there, what he does not do is say, hey, cheer up. All right, he's in heaven. Look at he's running and skipping with God, you know. Just put on a smiley face. Cheer up. He doesn't do any of that. We're told that he shows up and he sees the hurt and he feels the weight of the moment and he wept. Which I think is so incredible. Or that God walks with us and he is so connected not only to the Father, but he's so connected with humanity, with people, that he walks in and he allows himself to feel the full weight of grief. And Jesus shows us that the only appropriate response in that moment is to weep. To weep with those who weep. To mourn with those who mourn. And he didn't do it because he's neurotic. And he didn't do it because he's weak. He did it because he's strong. Right? And blessed are those who are engaged enough with life and who care enough about something and about somebody to actually weep. It means you're alive. Right, Philip Yancey, uh, in his book, The Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants, he wrote it with a, with a doctor. And he argues from a physical spe- perspective and then he moves to the spiritual. And he says this, that when you feel physical pain, it's actually a healthy thing. And, and we all know this, right? But proof, it's, it's proof that you're still alive that you're still aware. Spiritually, it's the same, right? When you allow yourself to feel sorrow, 
regret, disappointment, and mourning. It is proof that you're still alive, that you're still engaged, that you still actually care about something. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I'm going to end with a story. All right, some of you who have been around for a while have heard me share this, this story, but I think it bears repeating, especially in the context of this conversation. Back in 2001, I spent a summer living down in the Dominican Republic uh, with one of my best friends in the world at that time, named Mark. And uh, we lived uh, in a really impoverished area with a local family, and we worked with the American teams who were coming in, and we did, some, we did teaching and worship and discipling, and we helped them get around the island, uh, and we would organize their work projects and different things like this. And there was a group from Colorado that came in, and we took them and traveled to a leper colony. And it was very, very, very similar to what we read about uh, the leper colonies in biblical times. Um, it was... Uh, within a city, but it was very isolated. There were 15-foot walls surrounding it. Uh, really, the only people who went in and out were a very small handful of doctors. It was essentially just a death camp. And friends, family, they would, they would drop off their loved ones into this death camp, and they would be left to die and suffer mostly alone. And if you know anything about leprosy, the way that the disease works is you lose, you start to lose first feeling uh, in your extremities. Uh, and then oftentimes they turn black and your extremities actually begin to fall off, uh, usually beginning with your fingers, uh, your toes, um, your ears, your nose. Um, and then oftentimes in extreme cases, you start to lose arms and legs. I mean, it is the most physically devastating disease imaginable. And in most places of the world, it's been eradicated. It doesn't exist. But at least 15 years ago in Nepal and the Dominican Republic, it was still very much a thing. And we were there and spent the day just being with people. And, and there's, as you can about imagine, there are no words. We didn't speak the same language, but it, we had translators and still there are no words. All you can do in that moment is we sat with people, we sang songs, we prayed over them, and we were just present. And I'll never forget, there was one room that was, that was off by itself, and I remember walking in there with Mark and a handful of people, and we walked in, and there was a gentleman that was, that was in worse condition than anybody else. He had lost both arms, both legs, um, there were open sores, um, he couldn't see he couldn't hear. If you can imagine that existence, that, that was this guy's reality. And I just remember we were all just physically taken, taken aback. It was just, it was such a gruesome, horrific sight that I just froze. I, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't move. And in that moment, Mark did what none of us were courageous or aware enough to do. And my buddy Mark walks across the room and he kneels down and he wraps his arms around this gentleman. And the gentleman begins to weep aloud, mourning, wailing. And a translator shared with us that because of his physical condition and isolation, that uh, it was very likely he hadn't felt human touch in years, if you can imagine that. And we just watched, and, and in that moment, there were no words. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in one of those moments where it was such a, such a holy moment where God was so present and something was going on that you just couldn't even put words to it. That's what was happening in this moment. And I would say this, in this moment, there were no words. There were no words. This man couldn't hear them if they could be spoken. Right? He wasn't trying to explain away his pain. He wasn't trying to give him all the right answers about God and why things are the way they are and why he's in this predicament and give him hope that someday things will be better. There's nothing necessarily wrong with those things, but in this moment, all my buddy Mark is doing is being present and mourning with those who mourn and comforting this man who is grieving. Uh, and it was a holy moment. Uh, after that, that night, that we all just cried, you know, <laughs> like they're just... No words for something like that. But you know, here's the thing. That day, as we're spending this day at this leprosy camp, 100 yards away, neighborhoods, businesses, people driving by, going about their, their day, buying coffee and groceries and reading the newspaper and watching television. While for some of them, their neighbors, loved ones, maybe strangers, were suffering alone. 
right in their backyard. Right? And I think for us, the question that we have to ask is, are we the people who enter in, who have the courage, the strength to enter in and feel the weight that things are not right in this world, to grieve with those who grieve rather than just skipping across the surface of life and changing the channel every time something hard happens, we see something that makes us uncomfortable, trying so hard to be happy, clappy all the time. But are we those people like Jesus who is willing to mourn with those who mourn? Right? For those of us who are not in a season of mourning, right, I would say that as Christ's followers, as his church, as participants in the kingdom of God, we have a job to do. Right? And that is to mourn with those who mourn and to grieve with those who grieve and not try to just numb or entertain away that sense that something is wrong in the world, that, that, that sadness that sometimes comes and goes, but to stay attentive to it, to let it do its work in us, to let it bore depth into our soul so we can experience God at a level and experience joy at a level that so few do. Right? And just a word for those of us who, who are in a season of mourning, because in a room this size, there's a number of us that are in a season of mourning, and I would say this, right? the blessing is not necessarily in the mourning, Right? But just Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And you need to know that if you're in a season of mourning, that is not something that you have to do alone. Right? And this is one of the reasons it is so, so important to not just be a face in the crowd and an attender on Sunday morning. That's not what it means to be the church. Right? And if you've never, I can't tell you what you're missing out on if you've never had the experience of being in a context where people really know you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they love you. People who are willing to carry the burden of grief and sorrow and pain and heaviness with you are people who are willing to pray over you when you need it. There is nothing like it, and just so you know, that is the design and the beauty of Jesus' church. All right, so I would just say to you, one, just know that mourning is not forever. That just because you hurt, it does not mean that God has given up on you or that he is absent. And you don't have to to mourn alone. All right, get connected. That's, that's why we're here. All right, let me pray for you. Lord God, it's hard to thank you for mourning. It is hard to get on board with the idea that blessed are the depressed, happy are the sad, blessed are those who mourn, None of those are a happy or painless experience, but I will say this, Lord, just as I reflect on the seasons of my life where you brought me to new depth, where I experienced you in ways that I've never experienced you before, where you carved depth into my heart and soul, were not the mountaintop experiences, but the valleys. And Lord, so for those who are listening on the other side of a podcast or in the room and I ask that even in this moment, Lord, that you would give them a spark of hope, that you would remind them that you have not given up on them, that you have not abandoned them, that you are not finished with them. In fact, that that, that mourning and that sadness is a part of something bigger, and that is that we are created for more, more than what we see and touch and taste and smell and hear, that you are taking all of this somewhere, and it is to a somewhere where one day there will be no pain and no suffering and no, no poverty and no injustice and no abuse and no loss. Lord God, give us a vision for that. May that be a spark of hope even in the midst of the darkness. Lord God, and for the rest of us who call Mosaic home, may we be a people Right, who mourn with those who mourn, who do not avoid the hard things in life. We do not avoid pain or try to gloss over it, but who fully enter in as you did, Jesus. A people of strength, a people of depth, a people of compassion, which means co-suffering, suffering together. May we be that people. May we increasingly be that church. So Lord God, we come before you now as those who mourn and those who comfort. 
And we ask that we, you would meet us now, even in this moment, as we sing these words, as we dwell on their truth, and as we reflect on you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.